Welcome to Unit 1. So now we're really going to get into the information, start our uh, very long journey through millions of, of details and thousands of years. So Unit 1, the beginning of civilization. Here we go. So before we start talking about ancient man, um, let me set the stage here. First of all, dinosaurs and man never met. That's a Hollywood um, myth that has been set up to get us excited about movies and get us to come to the theater. Uh, you can see from the chart here when the dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago and man came along about 4 million years ago. So they missed each other by a lot. Also on the chart here at the bottom, the humans timeline, you can tell that there was more than one type of what we consider to be man. So each type that you see on this timeline, um, some of them are very, very different from one another, um, but they are all considered man. So we'll talk about a few of them, but not all of them. I just want you to know that there's more than one type. Also modern man, us, shared the planet with some of these other groups. So the Homo erectus, see we're, we're, uh, we're right there at the uh, modern man, the Cro-Magnon man. We are um, right there with Homo erectus and the Neanderthals. So we could have met some of the Homo erectus. You don't need to write that in your notes. I just want you to know that, that uh, we shared the planet at one time with other versions of ourselves. So Neanderthals probably being the, the one we mingled with the most. All right, so this uh, Homo sapien is what, what we call modern man. Uh, you'll also hear it as Cro-Magnon man. Okay, so dinosaurs never met man. There's more than one type. We share the earth, our modern selves share the earth with other groups. All right, so the earliest humans were not monkeys, okay? So the, I know it, if, if you go and watch, you go to the zoo and you watch the monkeys or you watch the gorillas, they are so human-like. But we are too different in our DNA. You see here on the slide it says we are 1.6% different in our makeup. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but 1.6% is massive. That could be the difference between you breathing underwater and not being able to breathe underwater. So we, we most scientists, I'm not going to say every single one of them, but most scientists have come to believe that there is no possibility that we were ever monkeys and that we evolved from monkeys. Even though the characters I'm going to show you do look very monkey-ish, um, that 1.6% makes it almost impossible for us to have evolved. So you see here too the major difference is that monkeys and all other animals adapt to their environment but we, man, we change our environment to fit us. So that's a whole different level of intelligence. Now in recent studies we have seen where uh, monkeys, uh, whether it's a gorilla or an ape or whatever version of monkey, they are starting to um, make the make the their environment fit them um there's a, a really popular video where a uh, i think it was a gorilla took a straw took a uh, a little bamboo piece of bamboo bamboo and used it as a straw to suck ants out of a tree so that is definitely using your environment to suit yourself so uh, monkeys are evolving but that does not mean that they were uh, that we were them once. It doesn't mean that. So I don't know. Um, there's a lot we don't know. We want to say that we know everything and we want to sound confident, um, but we, we really don't know as much as the average person would think that we do. So, and I'll explain more of that later. So we're guessing that the earliest humans appeared about 7 million years ago. Again, that's a guess. It seems that human life began in Africa. We, um, all the oldest uh, things that we have found are in Africa by far. I mean, older by far than any place else on the planet. But maybe there's something out there we haven't found yet. Maybe we haven't dug deep enough. So right now, as it stands, scientists are saying 7 million years ago and, it be and life began in Africa. The first humans, Ardipithecus, uh, walked on all fours sometimes but they could also walk erect and they've discovered that um, that that's probably true because they they have taken um, the 
remnants of the skeletons that they found and they have figured out by the way that the hands are and the way that the feet are that it was possible for them to walk erect but they they couldn't do it all the time so they had to use all four so very animal like still considered man though okay this is probably what it looked like and again you see that that facial features look very much like a monkey but that is a man well it's a woman it's a woman and this is the smooth um, without hair version of it that uh, they've made a dummy of, of this somewhere in the world by putting bones together I forget what what uh, museum it's at but if you put hair on this creature this is probably more of what this this creature looked like so remember they they were in Africa so it's not like they needed tons of protection so they would have been hairy but not super hairy like you would think like a gorilla uh, they weren't like that at all they they had this light sheathing of hair all over them just for protection but not really for warmth so let's talk about the definition of a hominid basically it is humans okay humans that we may have evolved from uh, hominids are bipedal uh, and that means that they walk on their feet all the time okay so some scientists would say that Artipithecus is not a hominid because they didn't walk on they weren't bipedal they didn't walk on their feet all the time they use their hands sometimes other scientists in include them in the hominids so there is no right answer to that but the oldest one we think appeared about four million years ago it could be as far back as seven million years I told you we have no idea about about time and and when exactly things happen we like to act like we we do but we don't so I'm not going to ask you to know all of these dates I would like you to know that the guesstimate is that man appeared seven million years ago but you're not going to have to know which man appeared when so just know the seven million years and know Africa so hominids is humans Okay, so the first predominantly bipedal primate that we have found any remnants of is a creature called Australopithecus. So again, some scientists say they're the first hominids or homo sapiens. Others say, no, it's Artipithecus. Don't you love these names? Where do they get them from? Um, but we do know that they existed in Africa and mostly they were in Ethiopia they found them a couple other places but mostly Australopithecus has been found in Ethiopia and we we feel that they probably disappeared about a million years ago again you're not going to have to know who came when and who went when you don't have to know that just know the seven million years ago for man in general all right so we think that Australopithecus was the first beings of the Paleolithic era and that's about 2.6 million years ago they are the first group to use primitive stones um, primitive tools made of stone so Australopithecus brought in the Paleolithic era you need to know that and they're the first to use uh, stones as tools so that makes them pretty significant so this is what Australopithecus probably looked like. Um, notice that they are still, they still have that kind of monkey look in their face. They still have the fine hair. Um, they are, the difference though, remember they walk upright. And so their arms would have been shorter. Their hands would have been smaller because they're not using them as feet anymore. Um, so a, a different look. The most famous Australopithecus is a female by the name of Lucy. She was discovered in 1974 and she is the most intact of all the Australopithecus remains that have ever been found. Um, and it really gave us an idea of what this group of people looked like. So Lucy was an average Australopithecus. Uh, she measured in at 3 feet 5 inches and weighed 55 pounds she died at the age of 30 so she was not a child she was an adult they were just small we never realized how small Australopithecus were until we discovered Lucy so the reason they named her Lucy is um, as they realized what they found that you know this was this was a, a pretty intact discovery Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds a very famous song was playing in the background on the radio and so they named her Lucy so here is Lucy today. Anything brown is her 
that's her real remains anything white is what scientists added to her so you can actually go visit her I'm not sure which museum she's at right now but she tours so um, you never know maybe she'll come to America at some time or another but that's Lucy and again she was found in Ethiopia and there it is on the map in Africa all right so let's talk about Neanderthals uh, scientists think that they are our most direct descendants uh, we are both considered to be homo sapiens and again you don't need to know these years by heart I just want to kind of give you an idea so you're not you know lost in the wind there they appeared about 200,000 years ago and started to die out because of the ice age 50,000 years ago so around 30,000 years ago they no longer existed at all so they they didn't die out overnight but uh, the ice age definitely took a toll on them now the difference or the significant thing about neanderthal is they are the only ones that we have not been able to find any remnants of in africa at all they just kind of appeared in the area of the map that you see here so we found them all over europe there were some in england um, some in the asian world but not africa which is is very odd so we haven't figured out exactly where they came from or why they suddenly just appeared in europe of all places when everybody else was in africa all right so modern man us we appeared in their territory about 40,000 years ago so we were together for 10,000 years and for some reason um, our our modern ancestors did not die out because of the ice age where the uh, Neanderthal did and we're not really sure about that either here's what a Neanderthal would have looked like they are um, the picture you see here, the one that's shorter, is a Neanderthal. So they were broader, heavier, um, more barrel chested. And you would think, it just seems logical, that they could have survived cold more than us because their organs were uh, more protected. They have a heavier, more complete skeleton to protect them. They are heavier with more fat to protect them. But for whatever reason, uh, modern man survived the Ice Age and Neanderthal did not. Um, there is at this time no proof whatsoever that modern man and Neanderthal ever um, had children together. So we don't know if they were just so um, different. They were different enough that that gene mix just wouldn't happen you know like a cat and a dog can't have a baby together kind of thing uh, we're not really sure if if that just that mixture didn't work because they were just that different so lots of mysteries about uh, this guy here so early humans belong to homo sapiens we've already said that homo sapien means wise men or consciously thinking human this is the first time that we're going to use our frontal lobe um, so they I'm not worrying about the years I'm just putting this here for you to get some sense of, of time and space so we think that they be that they emerged in Africa between 100,000 400,000 years ago don't worry about remembering that again okay so we are very different in that we think with logic and nobody no creature before modern man or the homo sapiens has thought with logic as far as we know so let's finally get into the Paleolithic era. So the Paleolithic era is also called the Old Stone Age. And we believe that it started over 2 million years before Christ. Not sure about that date. A date we are more positive about is 8000 BC so it's most important that you know the end of the Paleolithic era and there will be a fantastic discovery in that time that uh, changes everything and heads us towards our modern man path so Paleolithic era um, probably about two million years before the birth of Christ but it ends in 8000 BC now why is it called the old uh, called the stone age because most of the things that man made in nature in their environment um, to benefit them was made of stone so um, stone tools uh, used as weapons to kill animals so that they could eat it uh, protection anything you can think of that you can consider a tool was made of stone now early humans these in the Paleolithic era they are hunters and gatherers 
okay so their survival was very dependent on their environment so how does geography influence their lives they have to settle in an area where there's water where there's plants that they can eat and animals that they can hunt so geography is very significant to this group of people because it is a matter of survival do they have everything they need in the immediate vicinity all right so they are nomadic and in, to say that they're nomadic, that means that they move from place to place to place. Now, were they doing it just because they got bored with the scenery? Or what was the deal with them moving place to place to place? And the deal was that they were smart enough to learn the cycles of plants that grew in the area and when they died out in that area but came alive someplace else or a new different type of crop came alive someplace else and so they followed those plants they also followed the migration patterns of the animals that they killed to eat for food so there they probably most of these nomadic groups had a regular path that they followed like a winter home and a summer home type of thing and they just kept moving back and forth between these areas that they claimed as their own so they are nomadic that they don't have anything permanent they move their village with them as they move um, but they're not again doing it willy-nilly they're it's very specific they're following the cycle of plants and the migration patterns of animals which how many of us could do that today so that that proves to us that they were not unintelligent people at all they were very aware of their environment it's a matter of survival of course they're going to be aware of it so we like to say in the movies they use caves as shelter so why didn't they just build shelters well they didn't have the tools to build shelters so they can't but did they actually live in caves sure if they were lucky enough to find one but hey how about we all go out right now and look for a cave are you gonna find it probably not and they didn't have GPS and Google back then so if you were lucky enough to actually find a real cave sure they used it but were they really truly cavemen no very few of them actually found caves to live in most often it was more like a rock ledge or a very thick undergrowth where they kind of dug under it for protection from the weather and from animals but if you if you actually found a cave to live in you were doing pretty daggone good back then so their wish was to have a, a cave to live in but it didn't always come to fruition now they did live in clans which meant that means that they they stayed with their relatives and it wasn't because um, they were super into family ties it was because they needed it for protection and they also needed multiple people to go on hunts because the animals were big and mean and wild and they did not have very good weapons so very often it was this this uh, strategic plan to take down a larger animal or a vicious animal so that they had something to eat and you couldn't do it with one or two people so it's for protection and survival and a food source that you need these people um, to live with these people so you stayed with your family those that you knew and children were encouraged because that meant more people in the clan to help uh, gather and to hunt so they do develop an oral language this very early man develops a oral language now it's not like we think of today uh, it was probably more different types of grunts and, and, and groans more than specific words um, but we're pretty sure that it was actually men who developed the first oral language and ladies that is not because we weren't smart enough um, definitely we were smart enough but women didn't need to strategize women just because of their physical building were were more adept at climbing trees um, to get fruit or ants like the like gorillas um, or little, have little fingers women had little fingers where they could dig into the roots of a plant and pull them out um, men were just more uh, physically fit to go and take down a large animal where m women were more physically fit fitted towards climbing trees and digging so men had to get together and devise a plan how do we take down this vicious animal and so it is believed that men developed 
a, a way to talk to one another so that they could strategize this plan or maybe yell out a change at the last minute when they're in the middle of fighting this animal and it basically was because of hunting. So oral language came about because of hunting. Um, it might even have been in the form of like whistles just to say I'm over here but it is considered oral language and again we think it was men that developed it. Sorry ladies. So here's some of the tools. Uh, tools and weapons. Um, these are for, you see this, uh, the little bones. Some of the bones over here are used for saws, uh, spearheads. Then you have actual rocks that are used as weapons, as awls. Um, so anything that you can think of that they found in nature that they could turn into something that would protect them or help them or make their life easier, these guys are going to do it. So mostly it's, it's uh, stones. So again, the old stone age. They did learn to make and use fire. And usually when I ask in a face-to-face -face class, what do you think they use the fire for? Immediately people say to cook their food. No, they did not know about cooking food. They didn't cook any food. It was for warmth, yes, when they needed it. Um, and it was also for protection from animals. They realized that animals uh, did not like the fire and they would stay away from it. So it was a sense of protection. Also, if something happened at camp and the women needed the men to come home when they were out hunting, the women would light a fire and make it so it was a very smoky fire and the men would always be on guard to look for smoke and they would know, oh, hey, we got to go back home. So no, they were not doing smoke messages like you see on some of the old westerns. You can't spell anything out with smoke rings, um, but just seeing the smoke at a time when there shouldn't be smoke, the men knew that it was time for them to come home. These guys also had um, art. They had cave art, in fact, which is pretty fantastic. You know, when we first started looking at these, these men, we didn't think that they were intelligent enough to be creative, but they definitely were. So cave art, I'll show you an, a, the best example in just a minute, but there were also jewelry. So they have found um, these little pieces um, when doing uh, research and digging in the earth, they found pieces that we think may have been used as, as jewelry or art pieces. So pretty fantastic. Uh, but again, the most famous is um, cave art. So cave art, um, we didn't realize how in, how um, in depth it was until a discovery happened in France in an actual cave in the Lascaux cave in France and this this cave goes on for miles and miles and miles which means that these people whoever did this artwork very often were going through the cave probably in pitch black and they might have had enough um, had figured out how to have a torch but not one that would have stayed lit so they probably had to keep relighting 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 um, so many of the tunnels you actually had to get on your belly and crawl through water to get to the area where we have found these fantastic works of art so here's some of the most uh, famous examples the one with the hands just that just absolutely enthralls me that they have uh, have their handprints on the wall in the cave. So this is, obviously was a tradition for a very long time because the ages of them are different and there's thousands of pictures in there. So it probably was not just one clan, it probably was many, but it does tell us what is important to the people. So you see that there's lots of hunting big animals, but the fact that they put a human hand there too to say, I'm here, I'm here. They had a, a presence, a sense of self. So I think that that is uh, pretty fantastic. Uh, we've also noticed in these pictures that the animals seem to be more intact than the people. 
So notice that the people look kind of warped even when the animals don't. Very often the people are missing a body part. Um, so there is a very old belief about photography and taking someone's image and putting it you know in a picture or on a wall and maybe that began with these guys that they were they used to believe if you snapped a picture of somebody in a camera you stole a little piece of their soul so it may be that same kind of belief because you're not going to find a complete human they all did it with something missing a body part missing so it could be that belief we don't know we, we don't know but they had it's a fad that they had and I just think that's fantastic that they were you know this this real cognitive group of people now this is the Lascaux cave um, so the bull that the bull picture that I just showed you here it is again in real life you can see how big it is isn't it fantastic so once they, once they, of course, discovered this place, people poured in from all over the world to be a part of it, to um, dig, which I hate the thought of them digging in there, but to dig and, and take pictures and see what the heck is happening. And something horrible happened because man decided to invade this ancient space. We gave the cave a black fungus. So the cave had sat isolated and closed off for 18,000 years. Mankind finds it, opens it up, and suddenly all the paintings start to disintegrate because of this black fungus. And so we had to seal, we took tons of pictures, sealed the cave completely off. You can't go into it anymore because we want to preserve it. And then they created a mock cave with all the, from all the pictures, they, you know, recreated it it's fake but you can go look at that and it's supposed to be identical to what is on the walls of the cave but of course you're not going to really get the the same sensation but uh it, it's sad that we actually made the cave sick all right so here we go summing it up i'm not going to read all this to you you guys are way too intelligent for that but if you want to if you wanted a uh, slide that summed it all up what's most important about the paleolithic era there it is all right, so let's get into the next era. And it's, again, you see that 8,000 BC, so the end of Paleolithic and the start of Neolithic, 8,000 BC. So it's the new stone age in the Neolithic, Neo, new. Okay, and they lasted till about 3000 BC. And this is when they discovered agriculture. That is that fantastic invention. It's considered the greatest invention mankind ever had. So 8000 BC is that, that line where, oh my gosh, we know how to plant our own plants now. And suddenly you have a new era beginning. So with farms, people are, are gonna stop being nomadic and they're gonna start creating permanent settlements. So, so 8000 BC is that line where it changes everything and again we have these permanent settlements and they're going to create these permanent villages uh, basically to fit the land so they're all going to be very different depending on where you decided to set up camp forever so um, there I don't remember where this is at but they're um, they actually built them built caves out of rocks and lived in the earth we've seen many and this is a recreation but we found remnants of many that were um, actually put up on stilts because of flooding then we have just regular like you've seen this in movies of ancient tribes in america where they just made these little huts out of straw and mud and clay and some this one's in scotland i remember that one um, some was already there so they just took over these these uh, natural pits and use that as their protected place so every place looks different just depends on where you're at and what suits your needs best all right so they do develop agriculture right and we call that the agricultural revolution and so that brings them into the new stone age again because they're not it's not hunting and gathering anymore it's it's producing food so the three main crops that they had were cereals pulses pulses means something that comes in a pod like a pea and fiber crops and they'll use those fiber crops to actually make cloth for the first time instead of having to use just animal hides so much more protection 
they do domesticate animals for the very first time and start putting up um, not really fences they use more bushes to create a fence to keep animals in um, um, cattle are stupid if there's any kind of a blockade in front of them they're they're not going to figure out how to step over it unless they're angry and then they'll run right through it but uh, they they put up kind of bush fences to keep them gathered to keep them safe to keep them fat and till it was time to butcher them keep them in one place um, goats uh, any kind of animal that you can think of for um, beef they really weren't using that so much for to eat as they were um, the parts of it so butchering animals was all about using the parts of the animal for everything you can think of but there is one little animal that was tamed and domesticated not for um, food, a food source or a source for any kind of thing like that it was for protection take a guess you got it it was a puppy so dogs we think are probably among the first tamed animals and they were probably used as protection um, you know dogs bark when there's something wrong so it will be a signal to tell the village something's wrong that kind of thing so dogs we think are the first ones ever to be domesticated and it was not for food thank goodness because look at that little face they use much more advanced tools than the um, old stone age and you can see that they actually refined the stones there's some with holes in it uh, we're not sure what all of them were used for but you can see that they are much more refined than they were in the old stone age so much more advanced so you can compare the two look at the paleolithic kind of meager versus the Neolithic where they actually polished the stones into the shape that they wanted them for whatever reason. They also had free time on their hands. So Paleolithic you don't. You're constantly, constantly, where's my next food coming from? Where's the next food coming from? So you, all you do is hunt and gather. That's all you do. So now these people have a food source. They just have to basically sit and wait for it to come to fruition so they have plenty of free time waiting for the crop to come in so they have um, time to be creative and they develop pottery and weaving so we found examples of both uh, the pots here we think are about 7,000 years old and this this textured weaving is about 4,000 years old 4,000 years old cloth so I get a blanket from Walmart and a year later it looks like I've had it for 80 years and it goes straight into the trash. How is it that these people made something so well that it lasted in the dirt for 4,000 years? Yeah, good question. So they made the uh, textiles on looms which really truly have not changed so this piece of cloth that was made 4,000 years ago was made on a loom like you see here in front of you um, here's a much more um, more colorful one but same thing so you you weigh the materials down the strings down and then you weave material into it across it and I'll show you a better picture about that in a minute and then you have this thing called a shuttle that you you bring down every time you finish a, th a thread line you bring it down and you're crunching them together tighter on top of each other um, it's a very tedious process but it is still done today um, this is a lady who is actually making a rug and she's doing it with that same type of old-fashioned loom you can't see where it's held down at the bottom because her bench is in the way but it's the same thing you have all these strands she has a picture in front of her what the customer chose and she's making the threads to match that picture look how identical it is and she does one thread at a time and then she brings that wooden bar that you see at the top or actually it's kind of in the center you bring that down and you have to have somebody help you and you smoosh all the threads together so this is in Kusadasi Turkey um, like three years ago so they're still they still use it let me show you an up close there you go you can see that she has it so similar to the picture just amazing and these ladies there was another woman on the other side so there's two that are constantly working and they they will get this done in less than a month and they do it all by hand amazing they cost a fortune but they are absolutely beautiful beyond it's beyond teacher pay so no I did not get one while I was there all right so again if you want a summary here it is in front of you I'm not going to read it out to you okay so freeze me 
and jot it down if that's what you want to do. All right, so how do we know the things that we think we know? Make sure you know the term archaeologist. They literally dig up the past. Okay, so here are the things that they look at. They find human remains, the remains of settlements, and fossils. That's things that are preserved or petrified in, in uh, like a, a cast, uh, however that happens, in rock. And artifacts. Artifacts, I think, are really, really important because it's it measures your level of intelligence. Artifacts are made by humans. So the vase, vases that I showed you, the piece of textile that I showed you, all artifacts because they were made by the hand of a human. That also counts towards those rocks that I showed you where they, they sanded them down to be smooth or maybe put a hole in them. They're, they didn't make the rock, but they made the tool out of the rock. And so that is also considered an artifact. So how do we determine the age of the materials they are testing? It's something called carbon dating. Okay, so the, they measure the level of carbon-14 in an organism and it depletes as something sits that, that carbon-14 depletes. So you measure how much is left and that gives you an idea of how old this thing is. The problem with that process and the reason I've been saying through the entire unit we think we think we think is because carbon-14 only lasts for about 40,000 years and then it completely dissipates so anything that has no carbon-14 in it is at least 40,000 years old but we don't know how how much older it is than that it's all a guess so I don't want want you to think the archaeologists are just willy-nilly making things up about years I mean they they try to base things on finds that have already happened you know comparing them to each other that kind of thing but the truth is we really don't know beyond that 40,000 and carbon 14 or carbon dating isn't completely totally accurate it's just a really 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 good guess so all of this is guesses all right, so we still have archaeological digs going on all over the world, and I'm going to show you four of them, the four that we consider to be the most significant still happening on the planet today. All right, so let's look at number one. Give you some hints here. It's located in England. Started during the Neolithic Age, not completed to the Bronze Age. So it, it went on for a very, very long time. We think it could be a burial site, place of worship, a calendar, some people say a clock, other people say it's a magical place where spirits come and dance. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Ah, it's Stonehenge. Very good, very good. Um, I have been to Stonehenge and every time I go there it is pouring down raining so I don't have tons of really good pictures of Stonehenge so I pulled this one off of the internet but it is a fascinating fascinating place um, if you are a world traveler and you want to see something fantastic go to one of their night shows at Stonehenge um, they usually do it when they know that there's going to be a lot of shooting stars and they do this like ceremony um, they'll do it during the full moon too it really is neat it's very surreal so if you're interested in stuff like that when if you go travel head to Stonehenge and do one of their night tours it's pretty cool all right so if you're asked where it is at you can see it here on the map there I put London made sure I had a map that had London so you could see where it is in um, in consideration to London so it's in a town called Bath um, it is a good ways from London. We had to take a bus to get there. So, but it is definitely worth it. It will be super crowded. You're going to have to wait in line a lot, but it is definitely worth it. All right, so the final three are neighbors, and you see the general area right there with the purple circle. All right, so the second site we're going to look at is Catahoyuk and um, it is a Neolithic settlement so it was permanent we are still excavating it in in a place that um, you know as Turkey but it also goes by the name of Asia Minor 
and Anatolia. So Turkey has three names, Turkey, Asia Minor, Anatolia. Make sure you know all three because if you don't and you have some kind of reading or something that says one of those three, you're not going to realize they're, they're talking about Turkey all the time. So make sure you know that, Asia Minor, Anatolia, and Turkey. So you can see here on the map exactly where Catahoyuk is, not too far from the Mediterranean. Here is a broader view of it so you can see where it is in the world and then you can see it on the map that is called Turkey. So uh, Turkey is located between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean and Catahoyuk is closer to the Mediterranean. Catahoyuk probably started about 9,000 years ago and it is or was one of the largest settlements in the world. Um, this is a time period where there are still people who are uh, hunters and gatherers, they're nomadic. So Catahoyuk was very, very special and that we believe they had about 10,000 people. So 10,000 people living together and these people were good enough at what they did to keep 10,000 people fed, that, that's a really big deal. So their houses were made of mud bricks and it was built in a very unusual way. They decided that they were going to terrace the houses. So instead of building out, they built up. They didn't really have roads to get from one house or one building to another. You use ladders and rooftops. So um, not all the buildings are completely pressed together. There were very often cracks between the buildings as they were adding new stuff. There were lots of cracks in between the buildings. And so one of the reasons is that, that this is such a significant find is because people would lose things down in those cracks and they stayed there forever and we're finding them now. So things that are very intact like doll babies and dishes and uh, people drop stuff. So um, it has made for a very interesting site where things are, are very much intact because they fell between the buildings and nobody could get them out back then. So here's what it looked like. Um, not tiny by any means and you can see all the people walking on the rooftops but it saves land and it's great protection um, nobody's going to scale a wall and be unnoticed animals aren't going to get in and get to you so it was pretty ingenious the way that they did it and you notice that it's right there by the by a water source they're actually surrounded by a water source if the water gets too high they can all head to the rooftops so pretty smart stuff um, here is a modern day excavation so you can see all the little squares. Now we have uh, decided that what each compartment probably was based on the things that we found, now, found there. Now there's no windows but you can see that they had a very specific place for everything. They, have their, they had an oven inside, um, they had a food basin, storage places, they had a bedroom or at least a mat that you laid on um, and they did actually bury people in the, in the floor under, your, under the bed. So the bodies of your loved ones, you slept on them at night. I know that's really weird but uh, that's what they found. So it's very organized, very organized, just no windows. And here again is a much better picture of it, how square it used to be, or square it was. So there's lots of art all over the walls of Catahoyuk. So just layers and layers. If, if you peel back one layer, there's more behind it. So we know that people moved in and out of the apartments and decorated it the way that they wanted to. Um, just, just unbelievable. But notice once again, the humans are not complete. They're missing something, a foot, a hand, something. They're always missing something. Here too, we don't know what any of this means. Um, are they dancing? I, I don't know. But uh, it seems to be more about enjoyable artistic stuff in Catahoyuk than it was in the Lascaux Cave. Uh, they found this picture and nobody's really sure what it is. There's lots of theories. I think the number one theory is that it is supposed to be a volcano and the damage done by a volcano, it turned everything black and ashy, who knows. But it's not just about hunting like Lascaux Cave was. So it's they're starting to get much more creative. So we know that these people had more time definitely because they can be more creative and they were thinking about things other than just a food source because they didn't really have to worry about that anymore. 
Uh, skeletons were buried in the fetal position. And like I said, they were um, they were under raised platforms, which was the living people's beds. So I, I I love this saying here. While people talk of the houses of Catahoyuk, they can equally be talked of as tombs. People lived their lives walking, eating, and sleeping on the bones of their dead ancestors. Ooh, scary, scary. So this is what it would look like. So you have a pit and you lay a mat on top of it so that you don't fall into the pit and then when somebody dies you just put them in the pit and uh, it's not disrespectful like like it said they're they're buried in a fetal position so um they're buried with purpose and then some of the pictures we're thinking on the walls uh near that burial pit may have something to do with their uh, beliefs about death or to say goodbye to somebody special or, or something like that. So those graves offer us a big insight into how uh, Neolithic man felt towards others, other Neolithic men. And we have come to believe that there was love, that this is the first proof of love ever found, and it was found in Catahoyuk. This is the, um, the skeletal remains of a baby that may not have even um, breathed, breathed a first breath. Very, very, very tiny baby. So either it was newly born or never born, um, not alive anyway. So this baby is um, buried in the fetal position but it is also decorated. You see the bracelets um, and there were remnants of flowers. Like, like it was definitely absolutely buried with great love and great care. Someone was very sad at the loss of this baby. And so it is our first, first proof that they loved each other or they at least loved their children. So we figured out the love thing, but there are some things we still have not figured out. And you see from this quote, and that says, Roddy Reagan, not Ronald Reagan. I had a student ask me one year, how come Ronald Reagan was at Catahoyuk? <laughs> he wasn't. Okay, so we found they found these these little clay balls, and they're fire clay. So there was a purpose. Um, they all look different. Here's a good picture of it. So you see, some has like a thumbprint in it. Some has a cross on it. Some are not really balls. They're just kind of a blob. We have no idea what they were used for. So there's all kinds of ideas that it could be sports. It could be maybe marbles kind of kind of game. Um, we're not really sure, but you can see all the different sizes and shapes, and they're everywhere all over Catahoyuk. So maybe one day we'll figure that out. They did, maybe, we can't say for sure, but they they could have worshipped a um, goddess, and this is her. She is the famous seated mother goddess, and she was found in a grain bin. So we're thinking that maybe she could possibly be like the goddess that protected the food or had maybe had something to do with fertility. Um, there's not just one. This is the biggest one that we found that was in the grain bin. But we found them all over Catahoyuk, smaller versions of it. Um, but it always has where she has feline hands and we think she's giving birth. I don't know. I think it's kind of hideous. But uh, the birth thing could mean fertility for sure. Um, being in the grain bin, I, I don't know. Apparently, they maybe thought that this mother goddess was uh, some sort of protection. I don't know. Ugly. There she is in a museum, so you can kind of get the idea what size she was. She was big. So uh, I hope their ladies were actually prettier than that. So let's look at archaeological site three and four. We have Aleppo and Jericho, and they are pretty close to one another in the Fertile Crescent. Aleppo is in Syria and Jericho is in what we today we call Israel. Back then it would have been, uh, well in ancient times it would have been Palestine. Okay. All right, so again it's in the Fertile Crescent. Give you lots of pictures of exactly where the Fertile Crescent is. All right, let's look at Aleppo. Aleppo is a medieval fortified palace in Aleppo, northern Syria. You do not want to go there. It's not a nice place, um, but it is considered the oldest and largest castle in the entire world. Um, 
so they used to use it as a citadel in the medieval period so a citadel means basically a fortress upon a hill where you can look down and see dangers that may be approaching um, so today it is Aleppo is the largest city in Syria and it is the oldest inhabited continually inhabited city in the world so we're guesstimating it's about 5,000 years old and it became huge because at one time it was the final stopping place along the Silk Road so from China all the way to the east coast of China to Aleppo in Syria was the Silk Road so it made it a, a pretty significant city and here is what it looks like today so nobody's living on the citadel at the at the top um, anymore but you can see how big the city is and and again it is not a a nice city and there's a better picture if you were standing at the bottom of the hill looking up at the citadel all right how about Jericho Jericho uh, was built nine or ten thousand BC we're not sure which not huge it's the size of three soccer fields but over three thousand people lived in that tiny space it was completely surrounded by a, a wall, which means that somebody was giving the order and had the money um, or bartering power to get it done. So it indicates a very strong government to build such a massive project. It's still there today. Um, this the, the part that was walled in is just really a tourist site but you don't want to go there it's not in a very nice place either if you if you love life you probably don't want to go there um, this is that place if you're familiar with any of the stories of the Bible uh, Jericho was supposed to be a place where um, uh, there were a lot of brothels and sinful things happening and God warned them to stop and they didn't and so God demolished the walls and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down so it's uh, Jericho is actually part of a Bible story too so here's what it looks like again it's just the remnants the wall is isn't intact anymore because the wall did come tumbling down whether it was God or an earthquake or whatever the walls did come tumbling down and here's some remnants of it that you could tour if you had, were brave enough to go there I don't recommend it and here's what it looks like on the outside very much um, like the the scene in Syria with Aleppo okay I think that is it for this unit um, we have many more things that we're going to talk about um, in world one but this is pretty much it so Happy studying, and I'll see you in the next unit.